This NPR podcast and the following message come from MuleSoft, named number one top workplace in the Bay Area by the Bay Area News Group, with over 70 open positions in their downtown San Francisco HQ and Mountain View Development Center. Check out their open positions at MuleSoft.com slash careers. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today... It's all in the family, that's no lie, even stays that way after we die. Leave Loudon Wainwright performs some songs about his life and his family. He's written a new memoir called Liner Notes on parents and children, exes and excess, death and decay, and a few of my favorite other things. He's had a tangled family life. He's had four children with three women. Two of the women, Kate McGarrigal and Suzzy Roach, were also singer-songwriters, Three of his children, Rufus, Martha, and Lucy, are singers, too. He's written songs about them. They've written songs about him. This is really complicated, Terry. You're going to need a diagram. He'll also play a song he wrote before the election. I had a dream. I'm not sure what it meant. When I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. Hey y'all, Sam Sanders here. Want to tell you about the only NPR show where you can hear about the latest White House drama and the return of TRL to MTV. The show is called It's Been a Minute. Every Friday, we catch up on the week of news and culture, everything. And every Tuesday, I sit down for some long interviews with authors, filmmakers, directors, and more. You can find It's Been a Minute on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. My guest, Loudon Wainwright, seems to have been an imperfect partner, husband, and father, but he's written remarkable songs about family and how we hurt and heal each other, only to do it all over again. Now in his new memoir, Liner Notes, he writes in more detail about his life as a husband, father, son, philanderer, and musician. His first wife, Kate McGarrigal, was a singer-songwriter, too, and she wrote songs about their relationship from her point of view. Their two children, Rufus and Martha Wainwright, are now well-known singer-songwriters. Loudon had a long-term relationship with another singer-songwriter, Suzy Roach, and their child, Lucy, also became a singer. The book, the memoir, includes lyrics to Loudon's songs as well as some of the columns written by his late father, who worked for Life magazine from the 1960s through the 80s. Loudon is officially Loudon Wainwright III. His father was Loudon Wainwright Jr., Loudon brought his guitar and is going to perform some of his songs. I've emphasized his more autobiographical songs, but he's also known for his topical songs. He'll do his Donald Trump song a little later. He'll also do his first and only big hit, the 1972 novelty recording, Dead Skunk. And he'll do some really great autobiographical songs. Loudon Wainwright, welcome back to Fresh Air. I love your new book. I'm really glad you wrote it. So the, the book is dedicated, here's the dedication, for the family and all we put us through. That has to be one of the most emotionally complex dedications I've read. It's usually, (laughs) you know, for the person I love most in life, you know, for my beautiful daughter, for my loving husband, you know. (laughs) So how did you come up with that as your dedication? Well, as you know, or uh, for some time, I've been writing lots of songs about the family. I'm really interested in the the dynamics uh, of, of dysfunctional and otherwise. And and my family, like most families, has has, um, has issues, I guess, to use uh, that word. Uh, so, so I, you know, I was just thinking about uh, the dedication, and it came to me, as sometimes these things do. And I, I like the sound of it, so I just... Uh, uh, it, it's also it, I like the fact that the word "put" is 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 can also be can be past and present and future. <laughs> so it's it's a kind of a, a historical but ongoing thing. Right, and the other thing that's interesting to me about the dedication is it's for the family. When you're a part of really like three families with children, you have children with three different women and are a part of th- three separate families, do you think of it all as one family? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the three, they're, they're different, the three entities or families, but we are occasionally, a lot of the time, actually, we were all to get thrown together for whatever reason. And uh, then it feels like just one big, uh, is it mishugana? No, that's the wrong word. Uh, what's, what's the right word? Mishbucha. 
That's the one. I knew it was an M word. <laughs> Mishpoka. You, you were close. Mishpoka is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. Which, which is fitting. Okay. <laughs> Since so much of your book is about family, the family you were born into and the families you helped make, let's start with your song, All in a Family. Do you want to tell us how you wrote it? Occasionally people ask me to write uh, for a specific thing, a uh, a movie or a television show or something like that. And I think, as I recall, there was a television show called Parenthood. Am I right about that? Yes, I think. And the word yes. w went out to songwriters. Uh, they were looking for a song. And uh, I wrote uh, this song, uh, All in a Family. I thought it was great, and they rejected it. <laughs> So it, it, it didn't work out, but it kind of did work out because I like the song a lot. I like it too. Why don't you play it for us? Okay. And, and I should mention, Latin Wainwright has brought his guitar. It's all in the family that's no lie Even stays that way after we die Leaves, branches, twigs on a family tree In the forest can be hard to see Mother and father are in charge And a brand new baby will loom large Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts It's a family life, so take a chance It's a work in progress, can't you see? And the why we're for is a mystery When the family fights, ain't no next door No one wins in a family war then there's that thing it's all made of Dare we sing that the thing is love Love heals heartache and familial pain And what family is not insane? That's Lud and Weinreich performing in the studio. Thank you for, for doing that. Let's talk about family. Let's start with the family you were born into. Your father was a columnist for Life magazine in the 60s through the 80s. He wrote a column called The View From Here. You were raised in an affluent suburb of New York. Your father went to prep school. You were sent to prep school. And you felt that part of your job in life was not being him. <laughs> what, what parts of him did you especially not want to be? Wow. Uh, well, he, he was a he, he sent me to the same boarding school that he was miserable at. Let's put it that way. We can start with that. He was kind of a depressive fellow, I'm sorry to say. I mean, he, I think incredibly talented and charming and handsome and people loved him and a big, powerful guy. But um, he he suffered from depression and uh, alcoholism also. So... Um, Growing up, I watched him try to write and meet deadlines and try to write books and not succeed at that. And he he was had a kind of tortured existence, at least that's the way I perceived it. So I, I decided I did not want to be a writer, I, certainly. So I kind of uh, got interested in acting and performing and went to drama school and all that. But um, then I circled back and started to write songs. So I guess I I could run, but I couldn't quite hide. He had affairs. Some of them were long as well as secret. He 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 drank a lot, like you said. How did your mother find out about the affairs that he was having, especially especially the one that was like seven years long? Um, well, I, I I don't know. I, I I think like certainly from the, the generation that they were from, I think there was a, a denial was was a, was a way to go. <laughs> You know, and I think probably my mother knew that he was out and about, but maybe didn't want to know the details or didn't want to face the reality of it. Uh, and then, um, I, again, both my parents are dead, so there's no way I can check on that. But but I, I think there was denial, and she didn't want to know. And, and, and he worked hard at keeping it a secret uh, and then um, f either got caught or confessed or something like that. Since things weren't great at home, did you want to be at home where things weren't great? Because it sounds like you weren't happy in boarding school. You weren't happy being away. Um, well, yeah. When it came time to go to go to high, you know, I, I wanted to I wanted to go to high school that where there were girls and you know um, high school stuff. But I was sent to this boarding school, a place down in Middletown, Delaware, called St. Andrews. 
uh, and as I mentioned, my dad went to the same school. Um, I don't know if I, I would have been any happier had I had I gone to high school. I and I, I wasn't uh, com- completely miserable either. I mean, I, I complain a lot about it, uh, but I also say in the book that it I got a pretty great education and uh, started to play in folk bands and you know there were some great you know played football and stuff there, there, there were some great things that I did and was in school plays which was very important for me also. Mm-hmm. So after you got out of boarding school you briefly went to college to study drama you dropped out of college and went to San Francisco and this was probably what 1967 yeah summer, summer of, love. of love yeah um, so did you renounce your privilege when you got to San Francisco because to come from a privileged family was considered so bourgeois, um, and nobody wanted to be bourgeois who was into being a hippie. Hmm. Well, I knew lots of other kids like me. You know, uh, when we first went out there and, and lived in a crash pad, as they used to call them, <laughs> on Frederick Street in in the Fillmore District in San Francisco, uh, some of the other kids were, uh, and I say kids, we, yeah, we were nineteen or twenty years old. Uh, you know, they had also gone to boarding school, and uh, uh, one of my crash pad mates was Donald Fagan from uh, soon to be a Steely Dan, Donald Fagan. So, um, you know, we were middle class or upper middle class kids, and 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 again, as I recall, that summer was not so much about political activism or social awareness, but it was more like just getting up and having fun and dropping acid. That's what I remember anyway. Well, you dropped a lot of acid, and you also for a while studied Buddhist meditation and spent some time in a monastery, as, yeah. you know, like a, a, a Buddhist monastery. How did you realize that actually that path was not for you? Well, the, the the monastery that I was that I went to, which was in uh, Virginia City, Nevada, was was a yoga monastery. Um, I, I think that uh, for some of us who who dabbled in psychedelics or, or took 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 those drugs, uh, there was a a, a logical uh, turn toward toward spiritual things. You know, you'd be on an acid trip and you'd be sitting there for fifteen hours. So. Uh, Things like uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the I Ching and and the um, Upanishads. I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these words, but you know they were they were kind of groovy and cool. And uh, you know I used to I, I was one I was in that subset of hippies that 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 were was attracted to that that Eastern stuff. And I have been in various parts of my whole life been attracted to that Eastern stuff. Still. Well, you know, I, I I like a good plate of rice and vegetables every now and again. What what about yoga or meditation? Well, I I, I can do I can still do some asanas and and and, and uh, I, I never could get the hang of meditation, but uh, I still uh, can do a an asana or or two. So, if you're just joining us, my guest is Loudon Wainwright, and he has a new memoir, which is called Liner Notes. So we'll be right back, and he's going to sing more and play more after we take a short break. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Delta Airlines, here to help people in pursuit of their dreams, goals, and opportunities. With the Fly Delta app, you can find, compare, and book flights on the go. And then when traveling, Delta will send real-time status updates to make sure that you are always connected and informed. Download the Fly Delta app now. So the first song that you became famous for was, you know, a a comic. It was a novelty song called Dead Skunk in the Middle of the Road. And um, I'm going to ask you to just play a few bars from that and to tell us the story behind that. Because that story had, that song had a really big influence on your life. Okay, here it comes. Crossing the highway late last night Should've looked left and should've looked right Didn't see the station wagon car Skunk got squashed and there you are You got a dead skunk in the middle of the road Dead skunk in the middle of the road Dead skunk in the middle of the road Stankin' the high heaven <laughs> Great, thank you for doing that, Loudon Wainwright. And I should mention here that Loudon Wainwright has a new memoir, 
which is called Liner Notes. So that song made you famous. It, I hope, made you a lot of money. Um, and it kind of created expectations that this is the kind of thing you would do. You would write really funny songs. And you've written a lot of really funny songs and really funny topical songs over the years. But you also wanted to head in other, you know, more, more serious and emotionally complex directions. So what were some of the, like, good things and some of the bad things that resulted from the popularity of that song? Which I think, well, a, song, a song I think you actually wrote after running over a skunk in the in the middle of the road. Yeah, yeah. Someone had already killed it, but I ran over it. And, uh, oh. And, and, and then, you know, said, stink into high heaven. And then I went home and wrote that song in about 15 minutes. But I uh, kind of sensed that it might catch on. And it did when I started to perform it. And it was exciting. What a thrill to hear yourself, hear your song on the radio, on the AM radio, what they used to call the AM radio. I don't know what they call it now. But but um, that was fun. And, and uh, certainly that there was money, money uh, that uh, as a result, uh, I've, all, all, I've said it's paid for a lot of child support, dead skunk. <laughs> yeah. But um, the problem was is that... Uh, I was became the skunk guy, and when you have a, I think it, 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 you know, it got to something like number twelve, and in some parts of the country it was n- number one, but 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 the, the, you're expected. Where, what's the next funny animal song? You know, where's you know about the aardvark or or whatever, and and that got to be a drag, and um, I played it for a while, and then I just got I got sick of it, and I, I put out a record um, after that that didn't have a novelty song on it or, or a funny animal song on it in any way. But it had some great songs. But, but the, the, the people at radio just didn't want to know. They, I was the skunk guy, and they wanted something uh, along those lines. So um, I, don't, I hardly ever do it. But uh, today is special. <laughs> <laughs> well, today's Autobiography Day. And you right. do talk about the song in your, in your book, so I thought yes. it would be... Um, no, it it will be in my obituary. It. The dead yeah. skunk thing will be there. It will be. It will be. Um, so another really life-changing thing, you met the singer Kate McGarrigal. And she was yes. a backup singer when you met her, when she started writing her own songs and singing with her sister Anna McGarrigal, and they became popular. You write that you got jealous, that it was, quote, too threatening <laughs> for your fragile ego. And... Yeah. Um, and then after that, you married Suzy Roche, who also sang with her sisters. And well, Suzy and I were never actually married. Oh, you were never actually married? No, we, were, oh. we, we lived in sin for nine years. <laughs> and, and had a daughter together. <laughs> yes, we have a beautiful daughter and, uh, named Lucy Wainwright Roach, yes. But we, didn't, we didn't tie the knot. So, you know, you were attracted to two really talented singer-songwriters, before they became famous, <laughs> yes. and, and once they became really recognized, you seem to find them more threatening. That's the impression I got from the book. I'm sure there's plenty of other complex th- things that ha- had to do with the end of your relationship, including, as you describe it, you know, your relationships with other women. Um, so how does it feel to you to write about that in, in the book? Um to write about those uh, about my marriage and my relationship with Susie, and I, actually, I've written all about those big relationships, particularly the ones where where there were children and, uh, in songs in, involved. And uh, uh, so, um, how does it feel to write about it? Well, you I, know, I, feel, I, I, I write feel about like all these confessing... people in the songs. So, I mean, they're all in the songs. <laughs> so why not put them in the book? Uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, it's tricky. Um, and it wasn't easy, I think, to write about. Uh, you know, my relationship with Kate, the brilliant Kate, who uh, is no longer with us. Uh, you know, th- that was a uh, we we fought like crazy, and then we split up, and then we fought for thirty more years after that about the kids. So, oh, how to um, raise them? Yeah, we disagreed, and 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 you know, the 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 the, the marriage continued. I I, I think. Um, Despite the fact that we, you know, were divorced in 1976, so um, 
Whereas in, my, in the situation with Suzy Roach, uh, she's my best friend. I mean, I saw her yesterday, literally. We, we were hanging out. So, it can, it, you know, it can, be, it can go all different kinds of ways. But I, I write about those people because um, they're the big, important people in my life, along with my parents and grandparents and siblings and kids, certainly. Mm-hmm. So um, you married Kate McGarrigo after she was pregnant, Pregnant, quote, due to our hit and miss birth control practices. Um, did yeah. did you want to be a father? I, I think I had a romanticized idea about it, you know, that and and I thought maybe it would make me more manly or something. Uh, but I was I was woefully uh, uh, unprepared f- for the reality of it, uh, and uh, consequentially, I mean, I. I I, I feel like I wasn't really on the ball the way I should have been. I mean, I was uh, when when Rufus was born, my my eldest uh, kid, my son. Uh, you know, I was in my early twenties, and I was I was grappling with my career, and I was traveling, and I was messing up and uh, on the road and fooling around and things, and I, I I just was over my head with being a parent. I think. I want you to sing another song for us, if that's okay. And this is a song that I think you wrote after um, your breakup with Suzy Roach. And it's called Unhappy Anniversary. It's yeah. a great song. Would, would you just do some of it for us? Sure. Unhappy Anniversary It's one year since we split I walk and talk and get around Lie down, stand up and sit I eat and drink and smoke and sleep and live a little bit. Unhappy anniversary, it's one year since we split. Unhappy anniversary, it's ten years since we met. There is no need to remind me, no way I could forget. We fell in love, then we fell out. Both times there was no net. Unhappy anniversary, it's ten years since we met. My guest is singer-songwriter Loudon Wainwright. He's written a new memoir called Liner Notes. We'll talk more, and he'll sing more songs after we take a short break. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. XOY. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Swell Investing, an impact investing platform that aims to deliver profit as well as purpose. Swell identifies high growth potential companies that are working to solve today's biggest challenges like clean water, disease eradication, and renewable energy. Now people can invest in portfolios of stocks that align with their values. This is impact investing. It's also good business. Invest in progress at swellinvesting.com. So we've been talking about the relationships with women who you had children with and how those relationships ended, or at least the romantic parts of those relationships. Um, The third woman who you had a relationship with, a romantic relationship, and had a child with uh, was an actress named Rita Marie. Rita Marie Kelly. Yes. And um, you had a child with her. Now, you already had another girlfriend when Rita Marie called you and told you that she was. <laughs> this is really complicated, Terry. You're going to yeah. need a diagram. <laughs> I know, a family tree. <laughs> it, anyways, you found out she was four months pregnant. Yeah. And when she gave birth, like for the first year, like you didn't really know should you visit the child or not. What was your relationship with her? And that led to a song called A Year. Um, it's a great song. Would you talk a little bit about the song and perform some of it for us? Yeah, um, yeah. Rita and I had had a, a you know a, a, a love affair, but we weren't a, a couple. We certainly weren't married uh, at that point. And uh, she got pregnant and decided to have uh, the baby and uh, did. And uh, you know, I, I was not on the scene for that. In fact, I was in another relationship. Actually, th- I mentioned my daughter Lucy. Suzy's daughter and my my daughter and, and and when Lucy found out that she had this half sister, she was determined that she would get to meet her. She was about twelve at the time, so 
she and I w- went up there. Uh, they were living in an apartment in, in on the Upper West Side in New York. And that's when I saw uh, Alexandra, who's my my now 24-year-old daughter, for the first time. But it, it was a... I had seen her when she was three weeks old, and then a year went by, and I didn't see her. So that's how that you get the title, A Year. Would you play some of it for yeah, us? Yeah, let me just check the tuning. The only time I've seen you was about a year. I was afraid to hold you, but I wanted you to know I touched your tiny perfect hand Before I went uptown I didn't pick you up Because I'd have to put you down For reasons that don't make much sense And you won't understand I've stayed away for your first year It's sort of what I planned But I've been in your neighborhood Sometimes just blocks away I didn't come to visit you Because I couldn't stay That's such a great song. That's Loudon Wainwright singing his song, A Year, and he has a new memoir called Liner Notes. And I should say here that you and Rita eventually got back together again. Yep restarted your romantic relationship and raised your daughter together. Yeah, yeah. And then separated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, this, bomb. <laughs> <laughs> there's this long history in in blues and in, in pop music, in rock, songs about people who ramble or who don't want to be tied down. <laughs> and uh, And especially in the 60s, there was a whole genre of songs like I am a free spirit and nothing's going to, you know, you can't tie me down. I don't want to be with just one man or I don't want to be with just one woman. And your life for years was kind of an echo of those songs, but you wrote about that kind of life in your songs in such a different way than all the other people who who wrote about that. Yeah, I I was. I I had a chaotic, uh, you know, rambling life. And it was interesting, and it was the life that I chose. But I didn't, I, I didn't feel good about it. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a lot of bravado, you know. It wasn't like for all the girls I ever loved or something. Exactly. Like that. You know, it was <laughs> God. What am I doing, and why am I doing it? You know, uh, mm-hmm. it's making them. You know, everybody's unhappy, including me. <laughs> but what an interesting topic to me, anyway, to write about all that stuff. Um, you know, we mentioned that some of your patterns, like, you know, having relationships with other women while you were, you know, married or raising a child with someone who you were in a long-term relationship with, and you realized that at some point you were repeating some of the behavior that your father had followed. Um, did you see his life differently when you realized that your life was in some ways an echo of some of his behavior? Well, it's funny, I, I, and one of the things I write in the, about, about in the book is about this trip to Australia that we took. I think it was probably the two of us. I, I did. I went to Australia for the first time in 1982, and they threw in an extra plane ticket. And so I, my father, who had always wanted to go to Australia, came with me, and uh, he was a new father. I have a half-sister called Anna Wainwright, Anna Faye Wainwright. And, uh, and of course, he, he had four kids, me and my siblings, from his other marriage. So we were a couple of guys out on the road with with split up families, and now he he had quit drinking at that point, uh, so it wasn't like we were sitting around getting smashed every night. But there there was a a, a feeling uh, again of that we are where we're a little bit like the same person, or we're, there are a lot of similarities. And I mean, I don't know if that answers your question in any way, but um, 
uh, does it? I guess part of my question is when you re-examined his life through the lens of your adult life, Yeah. did you have more sympathy for him? Or were you equally angry at him and at yourself? Well, I know that I have a lot, I have more sympathy for him now, and, and that's just because I'm I'm much I'm older and and I, I I've I've lived a, a while. Um, I'm not I don't feel like I'm angry at my father at all anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I can appreciate. Um, he was a creative guy. He wrote beautifully um, these columns he wrote in Life magazine, some of which are included in my book. He was a beautiful, elegant writer, I thought. And his dream was to write uh, books, you know, like most writers. He wanted to write short stories and novels. He did have a few short stories uh, when he was a very young man in The New Yorker. But because he had kids really quickly, he had to go out and earn a living. And he got hired at Life magazine, and he worked there for his entire life. And and so his dream had been deferred. So I, I, I think I understand... Uh, you know that, that that was very painful and difficult for him, and I, I can I can appreciate how that that could have informed some of his behavior. You have his name. Yeah. Um, he was Loudon Wainwright Jr. You're Loudon Wainwright the third. And my impression from your memoir is that you kind of resented having the same name as he did, because I mean you didn't want to be him, and. Here you were, just connected even by name. And just seeing your name on paper, people would have to ask, is that Loudon Wainwright, the magazine writer? Mm -hmm. And so how did it feel when you put out your first album and you were Loudon Wainwright the third? Because I think a lot of people, maybe me included, thought, oh, the third is probably ironic because it sounds so kind of like formal and um, kingly. (laughs) Yes. um, but it was your 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 actual name. Did you want to use the third on the album? Not particularly, but you know we have the same name, Loudon. Get a load of the middle name, Loudon Snowden Wainwright is is the name. And uh, when I got a record deal uh, in 1969 with the Atlantic, you know, and I was going to make my first record, and I was going to call it what my name was. So w- there was a discussion between me and my father about whether or not to use the Roman numeral three which, you know, had a, a kind of highfalutin, preppy... I mean, Loudon and is is a weird enough name to begin with. But uh, he convinced me to use the Roman numeral, the argument being that this confusion between who was who would be solved by that, and also that the memory of my grandfather, Loudon Wainwright I, would somehow be honored if... Um, or dishonored if I didn't use it. So I did use it, and... Um, but then I realized soon after that that in his byline, uh, you know, his his name in the um, in his articles the, of the View from Here column, he didn't use Junior. It was Loudon Wainwright, and I had a I thought, wait a minute. So sure enough, I waited <laughs> until he was in the hospital dying, and I said, you know, Dad, I got to talk to you about this thing that's been bothering me for years. You didn't use uh, your junior thing, and you made me use the, the third thing. What's all, what's all that about? And he kind of looked up at me in the hospital bed and said, you can have the name when I die. So, Which is an interesting thing to say, but you didn't change it. Like on your book cover, no, I use the third. Loudon Wainwright I, the third. I, yeah. Sometimes when I, use, when, I, when I get work as an actor, I, I lop off the, the Roman numeral. But I'm comfortable with being the third. <laughs> <laughs> My first album uh, was called Loudon Wainwright the Third, and then the second album was called Album Two. And then, <laughs> and then I said to my manager at the time, I said, "Why don't we call it the Third Third Thirty Three and a Third?" <laughs> he said, "No." So we called it Album Three. Was your father angry that you were bringing this up, basically, on his deathbed? Probably, and, and <laughs> he should have been. I mean, I was I was trying to get last licks or something like that. It was a pretty pretty tacky thing to do. On the other hand, though, I, I'm glad I got to to air my feelings, as they say, and to find out the information, like why. Yeah, yeah. My guest is singer songwriter Loudon Wainwright. His new memoir is called Liner Notes. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. 
You should also check out Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, NPR's news quiz. It's funny. I can tell you that the host, Peter Sagal, is funny even when he's off stage. Wait, Wait's senior producer, Ian Chillog, used to make me laugh when he worked on our show. You can listen to Wait, Wait at npr.org slash podcast. You know, you write about how your father's death was in some ways liberating, but at the same time, you were just like overcome with this grief you didn't even know you had. You just, you heard yourself bawling. Yeah. Um, And then you write about how when your mother died, you just fell apart. I mean, you just like sank into this depression. What was the difference between those two deaths for you emotionally? Well, I, you know, my father and I had a, were, were competitive. You know, we went to the same boarding school. We had the same name. We were, you know, father-son competitors uh, in that kind of Oedipal way. You know, so when he died, uh, I felt somewhat liberated, and, and he was kind of out of the way in a sense. When my mother got sick, and, and I knew it was going to be bad because she was the most— my biggest fan, my biggest supporter, uh, you know, she was at every show and every little league. You know, she would come to see me play baseball, and I wasn't a very good baseball player, and I would literally hit a home run when she was in the stands. I mean, that's how much power she had to kind of free me up and relax me. So um, I knew it was going to be bad when my mother died, but when it happened, I was living in London at the time, and, and I just, I completely uh, fell apart, really. I mean, I... I couldn't hardly do anything for six months or a year. You have a beautiful song about that called Homeless. Um, Would you play some of that for us? Yeah. When you were alive I was never alone Somewhere in the world there was something called home As long as you live, I would be all right. There were reasons to win and incentives to fight. Now I'm smoking again. I thought all that was through. And I don't want to live. But what else can I do? Feel like I've faked all that I ever did And I've grown a gray beard But I cry like a kid That's a really beautiful song. So several of your children were not planned. They were surprises. Yeah. And um, and now they're adults. Yeah. And it must be so, I, I don't have children, but it must be so interesting to have watched children who you didn't expect to have become not only born, but then like become full people and to see what that moment in your life led to. Yeah. No, I have four kids and they're all formidable uh, you know, three of them are singers and talented and songwriters and very talented. Rufus and Martha and Lucy are are in the business and, and doing well in their own own particular and interesting ways. And, and um, Lexi is, is uh, just out of college. And, um, yeah, they're all powerful, complicated, uh, swinging kids. <laughs> <laughs> So what's, can you give us some sense of your relationship with them now, now that you're all adults? What day is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's, it's a, it fluctuates, you know. Um, Rufus is pissed off at me now, so we won't talk for a while. But we, it, we, we have these things, you know, and uh, Rufus and Martha, at any rate, uh, like to write songs about uh, our relationship. But um, th- this stuff blows over, too. I mean, we, in last February, or at the beginning of the year, we went, we all went on this Kayamo uh, songwriter cruise thing as the Wainwright family. And we, we all uh, sang together and uh, were on this boat together and had a ball. We, we, we do great when we're on stage together. 
<laughs> it's around that Thanksgiving table that's where the trouble starts. <laughs> My guest is singer-songwriter Loudon Wainwright. His new memoir is called Liner Notes. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Canary. Canary believes protecting your home should be simple. That's why Canary designed an HD security system that sets up in seconds and connects right to your phone. Watch live and recorded video, monitor your home's air quality, or in an emergency, sound the 90 decibel siren all from within the app. There are no false alarms, no long contracts, and no having to remember to punch the keypad before you leave. Canary automatically arms and disarms as you come and go. Canary is a new way of thinking about home security. Go to meetcanary.com and save $20 on Canary cameras with code FRESH. You know, we've been focusing on on your really emotional songs about family, but there's a whole other side to your songwriting, which is the satirical topical side. And um, in this age of the Donald Trump presidency, have you written anything about him? Well, I wrote a song. I wrote it before he was elected president, um, thinking, oh, this will be fun uh, and funny and, uh, you know, nothing is going to happen and... Uh, but it was interesting, though. It's, it's a song called I Had a Dream, and uh, it was somewhat prescient. Uh, I got two of the cabinet members down way before they were picked, and uh, shall I play some of it? That would be great. I had a dream, I'm not sure what it meant. When I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. There on election night right by his side. His flunky Chris Christie along for the ride But it gets worse, wait there's more He made Jeff Sessions Secretary of War Just like he promised, he built in that wall He blew up Cuba and he carpet bombed Montreal I had a dream I woke up in a cold sweat The Donald was elected in a huge upset He made a bad deal with Putin A secret pact with Assad He told the Pope where to go I swear to God As for the Supreme Court Trump got to choose He filled the vacancy up With Lion Ted Cruz Remember him? His face was bright orange, his hair was just weird, but we were made great again, embarrassed and feared. I had a dream, and here's how it went. I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. His little finger on the button, he was doing his thing. Our new national anthem was my ding a lang. We were bought and sold like in Monopoly. He had the most hotels in the land of the free. Locked up the dem locked up the opposition and the demonstrators too. That would be me and it might be you. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. That's really funny. Do you feel a need to update it, or do you feel like you got it already? <sighs> I think I got the general idea. I mean, it's not, it's, <laughs> it isn't big yucks now, but I, it's still kind of interesting to sing it. Do, do you perform that a lot? I, I, I perform it from time to time. I perform it more than I perform Dead Skunk, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> let's end with another song that relates to your father, because he had said to you once, or no, I think you read it actually right. in one of his columns. Right. That he he wrote, I want a double lifetime. Yeah, he wanted to live longer. Yeah, um, he it was on this trip that we took in '82 to Australia, and I, I after he died in '88, uh, Martha Fay, the the woman that he he had lived with for the last 20 years of his life, gave me the, these little black notebooks that he used to carry around and write in, and uh, he talked about what it was like to be with me on this trip but he also he had just become a father at the age of 59 
and he he wrote in this book, "I want a double lifetime," which I always thought was a pretty cool line, and so I wrote this song. I want a double lifetime. I want to start over. One lifetime's not enough. I need another. Seventy years on a practice run. Practice makes perfect. I'm about half done. I want a double lifetime. Want a double lifetime. I don't want to snuff it. Three score and ten just ain't enough. It feels like I finally got it all figured out. I'm almost free from the shame and the doubt. I want a double lifetime. Yeah, a lot more time, that's what I need I can make my move, I can do the deed I know I'm greedy What do I care for the afterlife? I don't want to go there I want a double lifetime, man I deserve it, I want it so bad I even got the nerve it's gonna take To get down on my bended knees And beg and pray and say Pretty please, give me a double lifetime All right I want a double lifetime. I wasted my first one the first time around. That's always the worst one. You don't know what you're doing and you just can't wait. So you go ahead and do it and then it's too late. You need a double lifetime. I led a double life in public and private. I want to lead it again. I'm not going to deny it. I'm just like you. It's true, you know. Yeah, ask yourselves. You ready to go? No, you want a double lifetime. Yeah, a little more time, cause you know I never want to keep living forever and ever. I know it sounds funny if the truth be told, but 140 don't seem that old. I want a double lifetime, not gonna get it, but if a miracle happens, you know I'm gonna let it if I eat enough yogurt. Maybe I might in the second time around, I'm gonna get it right, give me a double lifetime, all right. Well, I wish you'd get a double lifetime so you could just keep writing songs for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Loudon Wainwright, it's always great to have you on the show. This is really special. Thank you so much, and congratulations on oh, your thanks. Book. I always love talking to you, Terry. Loudon Wainwright's new memoir is called Liner Notes. Tomorrow on Fresh Air... So many friends from college have become successful. The new film Brad's Status stars Ben Stiller as someone overcome by corrosive jealousy of his old college friends who are more successful than he is. My guest will be the film's writer and director Mike White, who also wrote the film School of Rock and created the HBO series Enlightened. I hope you'll join us. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director and engineer is Audrey Bentham. Our associate producer for online media is... I had a dream, I'm not sure what it meant. When I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. Hey y'all, Sam Sanders here. I want to tell you about the only NPR show where you can hear about the latest White House drama and the return of TRL to MTV. The show is called It's Been a Minute. Every Friday, we catch up on the week of news and culture, everything. And every Tuesday, I sit down for some long interviews with authors, filmmakers, directors, and more. You can find It's Been a Minute on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. My guest, Loudon Wainwright, seems to have been an imperfect partner, husband, and father. But he's written remarkable songs about family and how we hurt and heal each other, only to do it all over again. Now in his new memoir, Liner Notes, he writes in more detail about his life as a husband, father, son, philanderer, and musician. His first wife, Kate McGarrigal, was a singer-songwriter, too, and she wrote songs about their relationship from her point of view. Their two children, Rufus and Martha Wainwright, are now well-known singer-songwriters. Loudon had a long-term relationship with another singer-songwriter, Suzy Roach, and their child, Lucy, also became a singer. The book, the memoir, includes lyrics to Loudon's songs as well as some of the columns written by his late father, who worked for Life magazine from the 1960s through the 80s. Loudon is officially Loudon Wainwright III. His father was Loudon Wainwright Jr. Loudon brought his guitar and is going to perform some of his songs. I've emphasized his more autobiographical songs, but he's also known for his topical songs. He'll do his Donald Trump song a little later. He'll also do his first and only big hit, the 1972 novelty recording, Dead Skunk. And he'll do some really great autobiographical songs. 
Loudon Wainwright, welcome back to Fresh Air. I love your new book. I'm really glad you wrote it. So the, the book is dedicated, here's the dedication, for the family and all we put us through. That has to be one of the most emotionally complex dedications I've read. It's usually, <laughs> you know, for the person I love most in life, you know, for my beautiful daughter, for my loving husband, you know. <laughs> so how did you come up with that as your dedication? Well, as you know, or... Uh, for some time, I've been writing lots of songs about the family. I'm really interested in the, the dynamics, uh, of f- dysfunctional and otherwise. And and my family, like most families, has has um, has issues. I guess to use uh, that word. Uh, so so I you know I was just thinking about uh, the dedication, and it came to me as sometimes these things do. And I, I like the sound of it, so I just. Uh, uh, it, it's also uh, I like the fact that the word put is 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 I, he told the Pope where to go. I swear to God. As for the Supreme Court, Trump got to choose. He filled the vacancy up with Lion Ted Cruz. Remember him? His face was bright orange. His hair was just. Weird, but we were made great again, embarrassed and feared. I had a dream, and here's how it went. I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. His little finger on the button, he was doing his thing. Our new national anthem was my ding a lang. We were bought and sold like in Monopoly. He had the most hotels in the land of the free. Locked up the dem- locked up the opposition and the demonstrators too. That would be me and it might. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. That's really funny. Do you feel a need to update it, or do you feel like you got it already? <sighs> I think I got the general idea. I mean, it's not, it's, <laughs> it isn't big yucks now, but I, it's still kind of interesting to sing it. Do, do you perform that a lot? I, I, I perform it from time to time. I perform it more than I perform Dead Skunk, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> let's end with another song that relates to your father, because he had said to you once, or no, I think you read it actually right. in one of his columns. Right. That he he wrote, I want a double lifetime. Yeah, he wanted to live longer. Yeah, um, he it was on this trip that we took in eighty two to Australia, and I, I after he died in eighty eight, uh, Martha Fay, the the woman that he he had lived with for, for the last twenty years of his life, gave me the, these little black notebooks that he used to carry around and write in, and uh, he talked about what it was like to be with me on this trip but he also he had just become a father at the age of 59 and he he wrote in this book I want a double lifetime which I always thought was a pretty cool line and so I wrote this song I want a double lifetime I want to start over one lifetime's not enough I need another 70 years on a practice run practice makes perfect I'm about half done I want a double lifetime Want a double lifetime, I don't want to snuff it Three score and ten, just ain't enough It feels like I finally got it all figured out I'm almost free from the shame and the doubt I want a double lifetime Yeah, a lot more time, that's what I need I can make my move A lot of acid, and you also, for a while, studied Buddhist meditation and spent some time in a monastery, As yeah. you know, like a, a, a Buddhist monastery. How did you realize that actually that path was not for you? Well, the, the the monastery that I was that I went to, which was in uh, Virginia City, Nevada, was was a yoga monastery. Um, I, I think that uh, for some of us who, who dabbled in psychedelics or, or took 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 those drugs, uh, there was a a, a logical uh, turn toward toward spiritual things, you know. You'd be on an acid trip and you'd be sitting there for 15 hours. So uh, things like uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the I Ching and, and the um, Upanishads. I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these words, but, you know, they were they were kind of groovy and cool. And, uh, you know, I used to 
I, I was one. I was in that subset of hippies that that, that were was attracted to that that eastern stuff. And I have been in various parts of my whole life been attracted to that eastern stuff. Still. Well, you know, I, I I like a good plate of rice and vegetables every now and again. What What about yoga or meditation? Well, I, I I can do I can still do some asanas and and and, and uh, I, I never could get the hang of meditation, but uh, I still uh, can do a an asana or or two. So, if you're just joining us, my guest is Loudon Wainwright, and he has a new memoir, which is called Liner Notes. So we'll be right back, and he's going to sing more and play more after we take a short break. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Delta Airlines, here to help people in pursuit of their dreams, goals, and opportunities. With the Fly Delta app, you can find, compare, and book flights on the go. And then when traveling, Delta will send real-time status updates to make sure that you are always connected and informed. Download the Fly Delta app now. So the first song that you became famous for was, you know, a, a comic. It was a novelty song called Dead Skunk in the Middle of the yeah. Road. And um, I'm going to ask you to just play a few bars from that and to tell us the story behind that. Because that story had, a, that song had a really big influence on your life. Okay, here it comes. Crossing the highway late last night Should've looked left and should've looked right Didn't see the station wagon car Skunk got squashed and there you are You got a dead skunk in the middle of the road Dead skunk in the middle of the road Dead skunk in the middle of the road Stankin' the high that I, was, that I went to, which was in uh, Virginia City, Nevada was, was a yoga monastery Um I, I think that uh, for some of us who, who dabbled in psychedelics or, or took 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 those drugs, uh, there was a a, a logical uh, turn toward toward spiritual things. You know, you'd be on an acid trip and you'd be sitting there for fifteen hours. So uh, things like uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the I Ching and and the um, Upanishads. I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these words, but you know they were they were kind of Groovy and cool, and uh, you know, I used to. I, I was one. I was in that subset of hippies that that, that were was attracted to that that eastern stuff, and I have been at, in various parts of my whole life been attracted to that eastern stuff. Still, well, you know, I I, I like a good plate of rice and vegetables every now and again. What What about yoga or meditation? Well, I, I I can do I can still do some asanas and and and, and uh, I, I never could get the hang of meditation, but uh, I still uh, can do a, an asana or or two. So, if you're just joining us, my guest is Loudon Wainwright, and he has a new memoir, which is called Liner Notes. So we'll be right back, and he's going to sing more and play more after we take a short break. This is Fresh Air. <laughs> Support for this podcast and the following message come from Delta Airlines, here to help people in pursuit of their dreams, goals, and opportunities. With the Fly Delta app, you can find, compare, and book flights on the go. And then when traveling, Delta will send real-time status updates to make sure that you are always connected and informed. Download the Fly Delta app now. So the first song that you became famous for was, you know, a, a comic, it was a novelty song called Dead Skunk in the Middle of the yeah. Road. And um, I'm going to ask you to just play a few bars from that and to tell us the story behind that, because that story had, a, that song had a really big influence on your life. Okay, here it comes. Crossing the highway late last night Should've looked left and should've looked right Didn't see the station wagon car Skunk got squashed and there you are You got a dead skunk in the middle of the road Dead skunk in the middle of the road Dead skunk in the middle of the road Stank in the high heaven <laughs> Great, thank you. 
for doing that's Loudon Wainwright. And I should mention here that Loudon Wainwright has a new memoir, which is called Liner Notes. So that song made you famous. That way after we die, leaves, branches, twigs on a family tree, and the forest can be hard to see. Mother and father are in charge, and the brand new baby will loom large. Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts. It's a family life, so take a chance. It's a work in progress, can't you see? And the why we're for is a mystery. When the family fights, ain't no next door. No one wins in a family war. Then there's that thing it's all made of. Dare we sing that the thing is love? Love heals heartache and familial pain. And what family is not insane? That's Lud and Weinreich performing in the studio. Thank you for, for doing that. Let's talk about family. Let's start with the family you were born into. Your father was a columnist for Life magazine in the 60s through the 80s. He wrote a column called The View From Here. You were raised in an affluent suburb of New York. Your father went to prep school. You were sent to prep school. And you felt that part of your job in life was not being him. <laughs> what, what parts of him did you especially not want to be? Wow. Uh, well, he he was a he he sent me to the same boarding school that he was miserable at. Let's put it that way. We can start with that. He was kind of a depressive fellow. I'm sorry to say. I mean, he, I think incredibly talented and charming and handsome, and people loved him and a big powerful guy. But um, he he suffered from depression and uh, alcoholism also. So um, growing up, I watched him try to write and meet deadlines and try to write books and not succeed at that. And he, he, had, he was, had a kind of tortured existence, at least that's the way I perceived it. So I, I decided I did not want to be a writer, I, certainly. I, so I kind of uh, got interested in acting and performing and went to drama school and all that. But um, then I circled back and started to write songs. So I guess I, I could run, but I couldn't quite hide. He had affairs. Some of them were long as well as secret. He 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 drank a lot, like you said. How did your mother find out about the affairs that he was having, especially especially the one that was like seven years long? Um, well, I, I I don't know. I, I I think like certainly from the, the generation that they were from, I think there was a, a denial was was a was a way to go. <laughs> You know, and I think probably my mother knew that he was out and about, but maybe didn't want to know the details or didn't want to face the reality of it. Uh, and then, um, I, again, both my parents are dead, so there's no way I... ...of thinking about home security. Go to meetcanary.com and save $20 on Canary cameras with code FRESH. You know, we've been focusing on, on your really emotional songs about family, but there's a whole other side to your songwriting, which is the satirical topical side. And um, in this age of the Donald Trump presidency, have you written anything about him? Well, I wrote a song. I wrote it before he was elected president, um, thinking, oh, this will be fun uh, and funny and, uh, you know, nothing is going to happen. And uh, But it was interesting, though. It's, it's a song called I Had a Dream. And... Uh, it was somewhat prescient. Uh, I got two of the cabinet members down way before they were picked. And uh, shall I play you some of it? That would be great. I had a dream. I'm not sure what it meant. When I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. There on election night right by his side. His flunky Chris Christie along for the ride. But it gets worse. Wait, there's more. He made Jeff Sessions Secretary of War. Just like he promised, he built in that wall. He blew up Cuba and he carpet bombed Montreal. I had a dream. I woke up in a cold sweat. Donald was elected in a huge upset. He made a bad deal with Putin, a secret pact with Assad. He told the Pope where to go. 
I swear to God. As for the Supreme Court, Trump got to choose. He filled a vacancy up with Lion Ted Cruz. Remember him? His face was bright orange. His hair was just weird. But we were made great again, embarrassed and feared. I had a dream, and here's how it went. I dreamed Donald Trump was our president. His little finger on the button, he was doing his thing. Our new national anthem was my ding a lang. We were bought and sold like in Monopoly. He had the most hotels in the land of the free. Locked up the dem and locked up the opposition and the demonstrators too that would be for dead. And I've grown a gray beard, but I cry like a kid. It's a really beautiful song. So several of your children were not planned. They were surprises. Yeah. And um, and now they're adults. Yeah. And it must be so, I, I don't have children, but it must be so interesting to have watched children who you didn't expect to have become not only born, but then like become full people and to see what that moment in your, your life led to yeah no there i have four kids and they're all formidable uh you know three of them are singers and talented and songwriters and very talented rufus and martha and lucy are are in the business and and doing well in their own own particular and interesting ways and and um lexi is is uh, just out of college and um yeah, they're all powerful, complicated, uh, swinging kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's? Can you give us some sense of your relationship with them now? Now that you're all adults, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's it's a, it fluctuates. You know, um, Rufus is pissed off at me now, so we won't talk for a while. But we it, we we have these things, you know, and. Uh, Rufus and Martha, at any rate, uh, like to write songs about uh, our relationship. But um, th- this stuff blows over, too. I mean, we, in last February, or, or at the beginning of the year, we went, we all went on this Kayamo uh, songwriter cruise thing as the Wainwright family. And we, we all uh, sang together and uh, were on this boat together and had a ball. We, we, we do great when we're on stage together. <laughs> <laughs> it's around that Thanksgiving table that's where the trouble starts. <laughs> My guest is singer-songwriter Loudon Wainwright. His new memoir is called Liner Notes. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Canary. Canary believes protecting your home should be simple. That's why Canary designed an HD security system that sets up in seconds and connects right to your phone. Watch live and recorded video, monitor your home's air quality, or in an emergency, sound the 90 decibel siren all from within the app. There are no false alarms, no long contracts, and no having to remember to punch the keypad before you leave. Canary automatically arms and disarms as you come and go. Canary is a new way... For my beautiful daughter, for my loving husband, you know. (laughs) So how did you come up with that as your dedication? Well, as you know, or uh, for some time I've been writing lots of songs about the family. I'm really interested in the the dynamics, uh, dysfunctional and otherwise. And and my family, like most families, has has um, has issues. I guess to use uh, that word. Uh, so so I you know I was just thinking about uh, the dedication, and it came to me as sometimes these things do. And I I like the sound of it. So I just uh, it, it's also it, I like the fact that the word put is 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 can also be can be past and present and future. 
<laughs> so it's, it's a kind of a, a historical but ongoing thing. Right. And the other thing that's interesting to me about the dedication is it's for the family. When you're a part of really like uh, three families with children, you have children with three different women and are a part of th- three separate families, do you think of it all as one family? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the three, they're, they're different, the three entities or families, but we are... Uh, Occasionally, a lot of the time, actually, we were all to get thrown together for whatever reason, and uh, then it feels like just one big. Uh, is it mishugana? No, that's the wrong word. Uh, what's, what's the right word? Mishpucha. That's the one. I knew it was an M word. <laughs> Mishpucha. You, you were close. Mishugana is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. Which, which is just fitting. Okay. <laughs> Since so much of your book is about family, the family you were born into, and the families you help make. Let's start with your song, All in a Family. Do you want to tell us how you wrote it? Occasionally people ask me to write uh, for a specific thing, a a movie or a television show or something like that. And I think, as I recall, there was a television show called Parenthood. Am I right about that? Yes, I think. And the word went out to songwriters. Uh, They were looking for a song. And uh, I wrote uh, this song, uh, All in a Family. I thought it was great, and they rejected it. <laughs> so it, it, it didn't work out, but it kind of did work out because I like the song a lot. I like it too. Why don't you play it for us? Okay. And, and I should mention, Latin Wainwright has brought his guitar. It's all in the family, that's no lie Even stays that way after we die Leaves, branches, twigs on a family tree In the forest can be hard to see uh, What's what's the right word? Mishpucha. That's the one. I knew it was an M word. (laughs) Mishpucha. You you were close. Mishpucha is crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that too. Which which is just fitting. Okay. (laughs) Since so much of your book is about family, the family you were born into and the families you helped make, let's start with your song, all in a family. Do you want to tell us how you wrote it? Occasionally people ask me to write uh, for a specific thing, a a movie or a television show or something like that. And I think, as I recall, there was a television show called Parenthood. Am I right about that? Yes, I think. And the word went out to songwriters. Uh, They were looking for a song. And uh, I wrote... uh, this song, uh, All in a Family, I thought it was great, and they rejected it. <laughs> so it, it, it didn't work out, but it kind of did work out because I like the song a lot. I like it too. Why don't you play it for us? Okay. And, and I should mention, Latin Wainwright has brought his guitar. It's all in the family, that's no lie, even stays that way after we die. Leaves, branches, twigs on a family tree, and the forest can be hard to see. Mother and father are in charge, and the brand new baby will loom large. Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, it's a family life, so take a chance. It's a work in progress, can't you see, and the why we're for is a mystery. When the family fights, say no next door. No one wins in a family war. Then there's that thing it's all made of. Dare we sing that the thing is love. Love heals heartache and familial pain. And what family is not insane? That's Ludden Weinreich performing in the studio. Thank you for for doing that. Let's talk about family. Let's start with the family you were born into. Your father was a columnist for Life magazine in the 60s through the 80s. He wrote a column called The View From Here. You were raised in an affluent suburb of New York. Your father went to prep school. You were sent to prep school. And you felt that part of your job in life was not being him. (laughs) What, What parts of him did you especially not want to be? Wow. Uh, well, he he was a he he sent me to the same boarding school that he was miserable at. Let's put it that way. We can start with that. He was kind of a depressive fellow. I'm sorry to say. I mean, he, 
I think, incredibly talented and charming and handsome, and people loved him and a big, powerful guy. But um, I, feel, no, I, I, I write about like all these confessing... people in the songs. So, I mean, they're all in the songs. <laughs> so why not put them in the book? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's tricky, um, and it wasn't easy, I think, to write about. Uh, you know, my relationship with Kate, the brilliant Kate, who... Uh, is no longer with us. Uh, you know, th that was a... Uh, we, we fought like crazy, and then we split up, and then we fought for 30 more years after that about the kids. So, about how to um, raise them? Yeah, we disagreed, and, and, and you know, the, 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 the marriage continued. I, I think, um, despite the fact that we, you know, were divorced in 1976. So... Um, Whereas in, my, in the situation with Suzy Roach, uh, she's my best friend. I mean, I saw her yesterday, literally. We, we were hanging out. So, it can, it, you know, it can, be, it can go all different kinds of ways. But I, I write about those people because um, they're the big, important people in my life, along with my parents and grandparents and siblings and kids, certainly. Mm -hmm. So um, you married Kate McGarrigo after she was pregnant, Pregnant, quote, due to our hit and miss birth control practices. Um, did yeah. did you want to be a father? I, I think I had a romanticized idea about it. You know that, and and I thought maybe it would make me more manly or something. Uh, but I was I was woefully uh, uh, unprepared f for the reality of it, uh, and uh, consequentially, I mean, I. I I, I feel like I wasn't really on the ball the way I should have been. I mean, I was uh, when when Rufus was born, my my eldest uh, kid, my son. Uh, you know, I was in my early twenties, and I was I was grappling with my career, and I was traveling, and I was messing up and uh, on the road and fooling around and things, and I, I I just was over my head with being a parent. I think. I want you to sing another song for us, if that's okay. And this is a song that I think you wrote after um, your breakup with Suzy Roach. And it's called Unhappy Anniversary. It's yeah. a great song. Would, would you just do some of it for us? Sure. Unhappy anniversary It's one year since we split I walk and talk and get around Lie down, stand up and sit I eat and drink and smoke and sleep and live a little bit Unhappy anniversary, it's one year since we split Unhappy anniversary Life as a husband, father, son, philanderer, and musician His first wife, Kate McGarrigal, was a singer-songwriter too And she wrote songs about their relationship from her point of view their two children, Rufus and Martha Wainwright, are now well-known singer-songwriters. Loudon had a long-term relationship with another singer-songwriter, Suzy Roach, and their child, Lucy, also became a singer. The book, the memoir, includes lyrics to Loudon's songs as well as some of the columns written by his late father, who worked for Life magazine from the 1960s through the 80s. Loudon is officially Loudon Wainwright III. His father was Loudon Wainwright, Jr., Loudon brought his guitar and is going to perform some of his songs. I've emphasized his more autobiographical songs, but he's also known for his topical songs. He'll do his Donald Trump song a little later. He'll also do his first and only big hit, the 1972 novelty recording, Dead Skunk. And he'll do some really great autobiographical songs. Loudon Wainwright, welcome back to Fresh Air. I love your new book. I'm really glad you wrote it. So the, the book is dedicated, here's the dedication, for the family and all we put us through. That has to be one of the most emotionally complex dedications I've read. It's usually, <laughs> you know, for the person I love most in life, you know, for my beautiful daughter, for my loving husband, you know. <laughs> so how did you come up with that as your dedication? Well, as you know, or uh, for some time I've been writing lots of songs about the family. I'm really interested in the, the dynamics uh, of f dysfunctional and otherwise and and my family like most families has has um has issues i guess to use a 
that word. Uh, so, so I, you know, I was just thinking about uh, the dedication, and it came to me as sometimes these things do, and I, I like the sound of it. So I just, uh, it, it, it's also it, I like the fact that the word "put" is 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 can also be can be past and present and future. <laughs> so it's it's a kind of a, a historical but ongoing thing. Right. And the other thing that's interesting to me about the dedication is it's for the family. When you're a part of really like three families with children, you have children with three different women and are a part of th- three separate families, do you think of it all as one family? Uh yeah, I mean the the the, the three they're they're different the three entities or families, but we are uh, Occasionally, a lot of the time, actually, we were all to get thrown together for whatever reason, and uh, then it feels like just one big. Uh, is it mishugana? No, that's the wrong word. Uh, what's, what's the right word? Mishbucha. That's the one. I knew it was an M word. <laughs> 